Hey guys, it's me, Vance Dax. How you doing? So, in my last vlog, I was talking about how 2018 really wasn't a great year for me, and that one of the reasons why was because I wasn't doing so well in my courses. And I want to kind of talk a little bit more about that. Um, you see, in all the years that I've gone to school, especially in universities and colleges, I think one of the things I've learned is that it seems that, it seems like these colleges and universities, they seem to care more about, you know, how you write your essay and how you format your essay as opposed to what exactly is in the essay in the first place, you know, what exactly you have learned as you were taking this particular course. And in this recent course that I've just finished up, it was basically a class that was dealing with the Acts of the Apostles, taking an in-depth look at the Acts of the Apostles, taking a closer look at, you know, Peter the Apostle, Paul the Apostle, Stephen the Deacon and the First Martyr of the Christian Faith, um, some other small key players such as Philip and so on and so forth, and the journey that each and every one of these individuals took in their journey, in their mission to spread the gospel throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, even all the way to Rome and even to Spain the known world in those days before Christopher Columbus set sail for the new world. And yes, you know, white people were not the first Americans. There were the Native Americans. I don't want people to misunderstand what I'm saying. Like, I'm misguided, you know, because I know that there were Native Americans. There were indigenous people here, you know, thousands of years before um, Columbus set sail for the new world. But I, when I say the known world, I mean known in a civilized manner, you know, the way how we knew the world at the time, as far as, you know, Western civilization goes, Western and Eastern civilization. So anyway, um, I just got off topic here. Um, so that's what I want to talk about in this video. I want to talk about exactly what it is that I have learned taking this, this course that deals with the Acts of the Apostles. Like, the first thing that I've learned is that, um, you know the story about Philip the Evangelist who went to this Ethiopian eunuch who was reading a portion of the book of Isaiah. You know, in those days they had scrolls. I don't think they had books, they had scrolls. He was reading a scroll and um, basically Philip took the opportunity to evangelize to him, and the Ethiopian accepted Jesus Christ as his savior, resulting in him being baptized, and that was that. You know, all the years that I have read that portion of the Bible, in chapter 8 of Acts, I always thought that it was Philip the Apostle who went, I think, you know, I'm not too sure, but I think all the years that I've read the Bible, I think there was an Apostle Philip. I'm going to have to reread the Bible again just to make sure, but that's always, that's what I had in my mind, was that it was an apostle named Philip who evangelized to this Ethiopian eunuch. But as I read the textbook that dealt with the Acts of the Apostles, I learned, no, it wasn't the Apostle Philip. It was actually one of the first deacons of the church, Philip, Philip the deacon. It was him who evangelized to this Ethiopian eunuch and baptized him. And not only that, but Philip, he had a family. I can't remember if he had three daughters or if he had four daughters, but what I remember was that he had daughters, and these daughters had the gift of prophecy. I'm not sure if they were prophetesses or if they just had the, if they had the ability to prophesy, because sometimes when you study theology and when you study the history of religion, you kind of get the sense that, you know, being a prophet and having the gift of prophecy are two different things. And even the retired Episcopalian bishop, John Shelby Spahn, even notes in some of his presentations that, you know, prophets were seen as like modern day, for as they were seen like ancient fortune tellers, like Gene Dixon, but they weren't. They just had revelations from God. You know, they didn't have the ability to see into the future. They were given visions from God as to what would happen if certain things were to take place. Like, for example, when you read the Old Testament, you see this re recurring theme of the Israelites abandoning God and worshiping false idols. And they always have prophets being sent to them 
constantly telling them that if they don't turn away from their sins of idolatry, that ultimately they're going to suffer a high price, and ultimately they they disobey, they don't listen, and ultimately they pay the price, you know? They lose their homeland, they're sent into exile into foreign lands, especially Babylon, or is it Babylonia? Yeah, I'm just going to say the Babylonian Empire. They even were exiles in the Babylonian Empire. So, if they would have listened to the prophets, you know, Israel would have not have not have gone through the trouble that it's gone through over the over the millennials. You know, it's just that simple. So that's one thing that I've learned. I've learned about Philip. I've learned about Philip the deacon, and I've learned about I learned a little about his story and about his family. What else did I learn? Another important thing that I've learned in regards to the Acts of the Apostles is that there was a recurring theme about how the Apostles were teaching that it wasn't necessary to keep the Law of Moses anymore, thus you were free to live your life how you pleased. And there were Jews who took offense to that because they felt like it was like it was like abandoning who they were as people, as individuals. And they went to the church about that a few times. And, you know, at the uh, Council of Jerusalem, which was, I'm sure that those of us who have studied church history, we're familiar with the councils that the church had um, been a part of. You know, the councils that the church has had over the millennials, like the, the Council of Nicaea, which resulted in the Nicene Creed, stating, you know, what we believe as the body of believers in Christ. And then the Vatican II Council, which basically was a step forward in the direction of reformation of the Roman Catholic faith in the modern world. The Council of Jerusalem, basically, um, the issue was that, you know, you got to remember that during this particular time period, the church was made up of Jewish believers and Gentile believers were slowly being brought into the faith. They were slowly being brought into the church. And, um, you know, starting with the um, Ethiopian eunuch and uh, Cornelius, the Roman centurion. Um, so basically, the church that was established in Antioch, in Syria, Basically, the Jewish believers were going over there because Antioch was a, uh, a Gentile city and it was, it was predominantly a Gentile um, city. And they were telling the Gentile believers that they needed to be circumcised, which was um, a Jewish custom. It was required under the Mosaic law in order to be admitted into God's community. And it was an issue and they brought it to the um, elders of the church also the apostles at the time. Also at this time, I'm not sure if many of you know this, but, you know, there were two different Jameses during this time period. There was James the Apostle, who was the brother of John the Apostle, also known as John the Evangelist and John the Theologian. And then there was another James who was the half-brother of Jesus, who at first didn't accept that Jesus was the Messiah, until sometime after he was resurrected, and I assume that this James actually saw the risen Jesus. And basically, while this James the Apostle had his head cut off by King Herod Agrippa I, this James, the half-brother of Jesus, I'm not sure if he's called Saint James, or because I know there's Saint James the Apostle, but I'm not sure if this James was ever canonized as a saint. But he, he basically served as the elder or bishop of the Church of Jerusalem at the time. And um, basically, at the Council of Jerusalem, you know, Peter reminded the believers that, you know, when he was called by God to go to Cornelius and evangelize to Cornelius and his Gentile household, and how he saw that the Spirit of God descended upon them, that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, you know, he knew that God does not show favoritism to any anyone in particular. He does not show favoritism to Jews. He doesn't show favoritism to Gentiles. God accepts all people who have decent, pure hearts, especially hearts for God. Those who love justice, those who love goodness, and mostly those who love and accept God as their God and Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
regardless of whether they're Jews or if they're Gentiles. Makes no difference. And how he also relates his vision that he had before being invited to go to Cornelius' house where God lets down this big sheet or net that's filled with every kind of animal you could possibly imagine considered by Mosaic law clean and unclean. So there were both unclean animals and clean animals, ritually clean according to Mosaic law, and God told him to kill the animals and go ahead and eat, but Peter said, no, I have never eaten anything common or unclean, and God responds by saying, do not call what I have made clean unclean and common. And this happens three times, and then the sheet goes back up to heaven. Peter didn't have to do anything, but he was led by the Spirit when Cornelius's soldiers came to see him, to go with them, to go to Cornelius's house. And that basically, the, the meaning of the vision was that God has made Gentiles clean at least those that have good hearts, who have a heart for God, and who have a heart for Jesus Christ. He has made them clean and whole, so the Jews were not to call them common and unclean. And as they talked more about the topic, they came to the conclusion that it was not necessary for Gentiles to keep Mosaic law, that they could still be believers, but they didn't have to, um, they didn't have to practice Jewish customs that the Jews were required ever since the days of Moses and even before, in the days of Abraham to practice, such as circumcision. It wasn't necessary for Gentiles to be circumcised in order to be accepted into the church, into the body of believers of Jesus Christ. And, you know, they always had oppositions coming in their direction, and especially from their fellow Jewish brothers and sisters, you know, those who were of the Jewish faith or of the um, Jewish community and, um, Basically, they just kept on saying that, you know, these believers in Jesus, they're saying that we're supposed to throw the law of Moses to the wind. We're supposed to forget about it. We're supposed to abandon our practices and our beliefs. And basically, the Jews in those days thought that that was an unpatriotic thing to do. Because even though they knew that it was not required, they knew that salvation came from, came from God's amazing grace through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, they knew that it, they were not obligated to keep the law of Moses, at least in the sense that, you know, the law of Moses taught that you are not supposed to eat pork, you're not supposed to eat other um, foods that were considered ritually unclean. I think shrimp was on that list too. A few birds, I can't recall exactly um, which birds, but there were a few um, birds that they couldn't eat. Um, but yeah, pork was basically one of them. It was considered unholy to eat pork, to eat pig. So it would be like today, you know, I'm sure that there are some Jews today who would say that, you know, it's a sin to eat pork chops, it's a sin to eat bacon, it's a sin to eat sausage, it's a sin to eat pork rinds. That's what I think a lot of Jews nowadays would say. Um, so basically, you know, opposition from the Jewish side, you know, they accuse the apostles and the believers of saying that, you know, we need to disregard Moses, his law. We need to disregard the law of Moses. It has no bearing on us whatsoever. And as they talked more about it, you know, they pretty much emphasized that they weren't saying that you should just abandon the law of Moses for good. You shouldn't abandon, you know, certain Jewish customs. It's just that you know, the Gentiles should not be forced to be circumcised. The Gentiles should not be forced to um, practice dietary customs. Basically, what they were saying was that, you know, we are free in Jesus Christ to live our lives how we choose to live our lives. If we want, if, you know, there are going to be Jews, Jews who believe in Jesus Christ, who want to keep the law of Moses. They want to continue you know, the rituals of circumcision and dietary laws, you know, that's fine. That is absolutely fine. Basically, what the church was trying to say in those days was that, you know, if you were a Jew, and if you wanted to keep the law of Moses, if you wanted to keep the Torah, which was the Bible at the time, the epistles were still being written. I'm not sure if the gospels were being written just yet. And John didn't have his revelation, which would result in the book of Revelations. But basically, 
Basically, if you are Jewish, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and if you are Jewish, and if you wanted to keep the law of Moses, if you wanted to continue practicing, you know, dietary customs and circumcision, you could do so. There was no, there was no law, there was no Christian doctrine at the time forbidding that. And with the Gentiles, if you were a Gentile, and if you didn't want to practice you know, certain Jewish customs, such as the dietary laws and the, um, you know, the custom of circumcision or take a Nazarite vow, you know, you weren't required to. Under Jesus Christ, under the church, you were not required to do so. And there were basically Jewish believers who still wanted to keep the Mosaic law and they wanted to continue with their Jewish practices because for them, that was basically their identity. That's what made them, you know, that's what distinguished them from other people. They were their own people and they were proud of that. It was basically a patriotic idea and all about individualism that they kept the Jewish laws and the Jewish customs. But basically the church was trying to say was that, you know, you did not have to practice certain customs. You didn't have to be circumcised you don't have to obey dietary laws in order to be saved because it's not the law of Moses that saves you. The law of Moses just basically shows you how you're supposed to live your life as a decent person. As St. Paul the Apostle has mentioned in his epistles, the law was more or less supposed to show us what our sins were, that we were sinful people and that these were the particular sins that we've committed. Idolatry, adultery, not honoring our parents, being full of hate and envy, and letting our negative emotions such as jealousy and envy get the best of us to the point where we committed murder and theft. So, yeah. So that was what it was all about. So that's what I learned. I learned that, you know, there were still Jewish believers who still wanted to keep the law of Moses and keep certain Jewish customs basically because that's what they were taught their entire lives and for them that's what made them their own individual people. It was about individualism and it was a patriotic act. They did not want to be like the pagans at the time. They didn't want to be like the Romans. They didn't want to be like anyone else. They wanted to be their own people and that's what it was all about. So that's another thing that I learned. I learned that there were certain groups of people who came into the Jewish faith to a certain extent. I can't remember exactly, but I remember the names. Um, basically, Gentiles who believed in the Jewish God, but they, they were not circumcised and they, they didn't really practice Jewish customs. They were considered God-fearers. That's what they were called, God-fearers. And Cornelius the centurion, the Roman soldier, he was a, good, he was a great example, the main example. He was a man who feared God, he prayed to God, he helped the poor, you know, but he didn't practice any Jewish customs. He wasn't circumcised. He didn't keep any of the Jewish dietary laws, so more than likely he ate pork. And um, so they were called god fears. And I, there's this one word, proselyte. Those were basically, they, they were basically Gentiles who converted to the Jewish religion, Judaism, and they actually, you know, did what they were supposed to do. You know, they they were, they were circumcised and they vowed to keep um, certain Jewish customs and obey the law of Moses. I think there was another one called um, the proselyte at the door, which I guess means that, you know, they were on the verge of becoming accepted into the Jewish faith. So I think proselytes were um, Gentile Jews, you know, Gentiles who came to the Jewish faith 100%. There were the proselytes at the door, who I think they were on the verge of becoming proselytes, but they weren't there just yet. I can't recall if that's correct, but that's what I have in my mind. That's what I remember reading from the textbook. And mostly, Gentiles who did not become Jews, and of course eventually some of them, actually not some of them, I would assume all of them, who eventually came to the, to the Christian faith, they were called God-fearers. So that's another thing that I've learned. I've been talking so much that I've lost my train of thought of what else that I've learned. Um, what else did I learn? Let's see. 
Can't really recall anything else. Yeah. I thought that I learned more. I know that um, Paul the Apostle, he had the gift of prophecy. You know, it wasn't just, you know, Philip the deacon's um, daughters. It was also Paul himself. He had the gift of prophecy. And I think Barnabas himself, Barnabas who was um, Paul's first partner, his first evangelical missionary partner, I think he had the gift of prophecy. Um, and if I remember correctly, Barnabas... Barnabas was himself, I think he was a, was he a, a Gentile who became a Jew, or was he another god fear? I can't remember. There have been so many of these people who, they weren't from Jerusalem, they weren't from Palestine, they came from, you know, Gentile lands. They were Jewish, or they became Jewish. I can't remember for sure, but I think he was another example of a, a believer who was outside of the Jewish faith. I have to be honest, there's a lot of things that have slipped my mind. Another thing that I've learned, and this actually just came back to mind, um, Stephen, another one of the first deacons of the Christian church and the first martyr of the Christian faith, um, when you read his long sermon, you realize that there's something very significant about his sermon. He's pretty much giving a history lesson. And basically the history lesson is that the Hebrew people have had a tendency of rejecting their savior or saviors a first time when they came around. And then the second time when they came around, the, the Hebrew people actually accepted them. And he used Joseph and Moses as his prime examples because um, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery so he was like destined to become their leader, but they rejected him. And then when he became governor or prime minister of Egypt, and they went to live in Egypt, his brothers went to live in Egypt, they did accept him as their leader. And Moses, you know, when Moses took his stand against the um, unrighteous Egyptian overseer of the slaves, you know, resulting in his death, you know, Moses had his moments when he tried to step in and try and calm situations down, tensions between the, Jew, the Hebrew people and that one person, that one Hebrew person who was at fault in a particular dispute, he rejected Moses, you know, claiming that he knew that, you know, he killed that Egyptian overseer and eventually word got around and the Pharaoh wanted to kill Moses and Moses fled. But when God told him to go back to Egypt and when Moses and Aaron, his brother, told the people, the Hebrew people, what God had said and had done, then they accepted him as their leader. You know, every once in a while, yes, they rejected him as their leader, and then when things started to look good, they accepted him. But basically, there was a common theme there, and that basically, that theme was that the Hebrew people were rejecting their saviors. What if it was Joseph, the prime minister of Egypt, or if it was Moses, the man who was supposed to lead them out of slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. When they first came around, when Joseph and Moses first came around, their own people rejected them. But then when Joseph and Moses were brought back into the picture to deliver the Hebrew people from whether if it was seven years of famine or if it was slavery in Egypt, the second time when Joseph and Moses came around, the Hebrew people accepted them. And at the conclusion of Stephen's sermon, he was saying that the Jews in the, in the days of Jesus and in the days of the apostles, they did the same thing to Jesus. Jesus was their savior, no different than he's our savior. Basically, the Jews, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they rejected Jesus as their savior. And constantly, there's the emphasis that Jesus will return and that when Jesus does return, that's when the Jews will ultimately accept Jesus as their savior. No different than they did with Joseph and no different than they did with Moses. They're going to do the exact same thing with Jesus. So in Jesus' first coming, some people accepted Jesus as their savior. Not, not everyone did. There were some Jews who accepted Jesus as their savior, but not every Jew did. And as a result, they crucified him. And in the second coming, 
that's when the Jews ultimately will accept Jesus as their savior. As the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So that's another thing that I've learned. And the last thing that I want to talk about is um, Timothy, who was a young apprentice to Paul the Apostle. I didn't know much about Timothy's background. I didn't know if he was Jewish or if he was a Gentile. I assumed that he was Jewish. I probably had my thoughts that he was a Gentile, but in a sense he was kind of both. He was more of a Jew than he was a Gentile, but basically his mother, I think her name was Eunice, or was Eunice's grandmother? I can't remember. One of, basically he had a mother and a grandmother who were Jewish. One of them was a woman named Eunice. And basically, when Timothy was growing up, his mother and his grandmother taught him the Jewish ways. They taught him the law of Moses. They taught him the way to live as a Jew. Basically, Timothy grew up with a Jewish identity. But he had a father who was Greek. And one of the significant things about his father being Greek was that the Greeks believed that circumcision was a form of physical mutilation, which was considered a no-no. It was considered... I don't want to say it was blasphemous or that, or that it was sacrilegious, but it was considered very taboo to the Greeks. And um, so Timothy wasn't circumcised. And when Timothy met Paul, you know, before Timothy joined Paul on his missionary journeys, Timothy was circumcised. As an adult, he was circumcised. So that, you know, because Paul's method of preaching was that he would preach to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And if he was going to preach to the Jews, and if he was going to have someone who was Jewish, he needed to make sure that that person who was Jewish was 100% Jewish, which would include being circumcised. So, for the sake of the message that Paul was preaching at the time, and for the sake of his method of preaching to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, or the Jews first and then the Gentiles, if it's supposed to be plural, I gotta make sure that it's plural. But anyway, um, so if he was gonna preach to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles, he needed to make sure that any Jewish partner that he had was 100% Jewish and he wasn't just half, he wasn't half Jewish, but he was Jewish. And that's why they had Timothy circumcised, so that he could be 100% Jewish, so, he, so that Paul's message would be credible, so that it would be more believable and more accepted. Excuse me. So, yeah. Those are basically the main things that I've learned so far, studying the Acts of the Apostles during this course that I was taking. So that's what I wanted to do for this video. I wanted to explain the important things that I've learned while taking this class. And I think it's very disappointing that we live in a time period now where it seems like professors and academic advisors and deans and presidents of universities, it seems like they care more about how an essay is formatted and how the essay is written instead of what is inside the essay, which is basically, you know, what we've learned. It seems like professors nowadays, they don't really care about what you have learned as long as you format it in a acceptable, sophisticated, distinguished manner. So it's like they don't really care about, you know, they don't really care what you've learned. They just care about the academic success that you have achieved through the labor that you put into it. And it's just very disheartening and it's very disconcerting. And I would encourage all professors, deans, and academic advisors, presidents of universities, those of you who have been watching this video, I would strongly encourage you, please stop focusing on how the essays are written, whether if it's in <coughs> MLA format or APA format, or if it's sloppy, sloppy work, you know, please stop focusing on how essays are written and focus more on what exactly it is that the students have put into the essay as far as what they have learned from their time of study because that should be the important thing you know we don't go to school to show off how sophisticated we are we don't go to school to show off our writing abilities we don't go off to school to you know write 
essays that should be considered, you know, something that the President of the United States should be reading when he's standing at his podium delivering an address to the Rose Garden or in the conference room in the White House. But rather, what should be important is what did the student learn? Did the student learn anything? And that should be the important thing. Please focus more on what the students have learned in the time that they've been in school instead of how they write their papers. I think you'll be surprised to find out how much of a positive impact that can have on students and the world at large. So that's all that I wanted to say for this video. I'm sorry if I put you guys to sleep, but I'm really proud to make this video because I like to show people what I've learned. You know, sometimes my speech abilities are not perfect, but I think you get everything that I've taught what I've learned that, in a sense, I've pretty much taught you guys so far throughout this entire video, you know? I like to show what I've learned, that I really, I'm not a slacker, you know? I don't spend all my days sitting on the couch or laying on my bed watching the Jerry Springer show or the Maury show, and that's all I do, and I just stuff my face with double Whoppers with cheese from Burger King or deep fried chicken from KFC or Popeyes. That I really do things that are very constructive with my life because I want my life to move forward in a positive direction. And especially since I want to become a priest in the Church of Jesus Christ under the Anglican Communion. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for watching this video. I really appreciate you watching this video. Don't forget to comment and subscribe and don't forget to give that like button a click. And even if you don't like it, you can, you can click that too, you know. I like to know what people think about my videos, whether if it's positive or negative. Go ahead. Click the like button or the dislike button. You know, I don't care. Just let me know what you think of the video. I like to hear people's opinions about my videos. I like people that are opinionated. It's just if you start pouncing on me and you start getting on my face, that's when I'm going to say, okay, you know what? This conversation's not going anywhere. It's best for me to just get up and leave. So, once again, thank you for watching this video. Goodbye and God bless in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. No, I will not keep it in church. And peace out, yo. Oh. Merry Christmas.